Good morning and happy Sabbath from the IS Auditorium, which is decorated for graduation filming at the moment. It is good to be with you today. Human beings are, in essence, all about story. The story of where we came from and who made us. The story of what went wrong after we were made perfect. The story of promise. The story of those who waited for the promise to be fulfilled. The story of Jesus and our redemption. The story of what has happened since the cross, that pivotal point in history. The story of the great controversy. The story of what will happen when all is once again restored. We love stories. Children, teenagers, adults, we all sit up and listen when the preacher starts telling a story. Stories carry meaning for us, either hidden meanings or explained meanings. But we get those meanings and they inform and guide us on our way. Today, our sermon will center on one story briefly and another story in depth. As we think of the phrases, I will go and reach the world, these are stories we need in order to guide us, both as God's children and as many of us serve in positions of leadership. We will go, yes, but what happens when we get there? Let us learn today from two parables. The first parable is told by Jesus. It teaches us that when we say, I will go, there are no celebrities. There are no special favors. There is just one reward, and that is the reward that God gives to the young and the old, the rich and the poor, early and late. All he asks is that we go to work for him. For the kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. When he had agreed with the laborers for a denarius for the day, he sent them into his vineyard. And he went out about the third hour, and he saw others standing idle in the marketplace. And to those, he said, you go into the vineyard also, and whatever is right, I will give you. And so they went. Again, he went out about the sixth hour and the ninth hour and did the same thing. And about the eleventh hour, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why have you been standing here idle all day long? They said to him, because no one hired us. He said to them, you go into the vineyard too. Now when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his foreman, call the laborers and pay them their wages, starting with the last group to the first. When those hired about the 11th hour came, each one received a denarius. So when those hired first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received a denarius. When they received it, they grumbled at the landowner saying, these who were hired last worked only one hour, and you have made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day's work and the scorching heat. But he answered and said to one of them, friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for a denarius? Take what is yours and go. But I want to give this last person the same as you. Is it not lawful for me to do what I want with what is my own? Or is your eye envious because I am generous? So the last shall be first and the first last. So by this parable, Jesus taught that his reward is all the same for everyone who comes and works in the vineyard. This is our house in the Philippines. It's the left side of a duplex. And as you can see, there's not much there. We have one little palm tree in the front yard, which is not growing too well, and some plants in the planters next to the house. Last year, I was frustrated because there's a lot of what we call sensitive plant growing in the grass of our yard. It's a prickly mimosa, and when you touch it, the leaves fold up. Some people call it touch me not, humble plant, or shame plant. Whatever it is, it's a pest. I can't run across the lawn in my bare feet lest I step on it. 
So I hired some teenage boys on our campus to come and get the sensitive plant out of our lawn. There were four of them, and they expected me to pay them a lot more than the 25 pesos an hour that my neighbor recommended. I watched those workers. One of them worked steadily doing the job before him. Two did some work, but also talked a lot and took breaks. And the fourth one just stood around and talked and wandered around and occasionally took a chop at a sensitive plant with his hoe. Would Jesus have hired these boys to go into the vineyard and harvest the fruit? Would he have told a story where they were all paid the same? You see, it's not just the time that is spent in the field, but it is also the quality of work that people put in when they go to reach the world. The quality matters. How do I know this? Well, recently I came across a parable by Ellen G. White, one of the founders of our church. I had never heard this parable ever before in my life, and it has intrigued me ever since I read it. It's found in a book called Gospel Workers, and the title of this chapter is Gathering the Fruit, a Dream. I believe it illustrates well the importance of the quality of work that we do when we respond to God and say, I will go. You may or may not have ever gone berry picking. I've picked purple huckleberries and blue blueberries and red raspberries and dark purple blackberries. And when I lived in Finland as a student missionary, I picked sour red berries called puolukka or lingonberries. Those made very nice jelly. But even if you've never picked any of those berries, no doubt you have all picked some kind of fruit where you live. And you can still apply the principles of Ellen White's berry picking dream to your experience. Let's dive into the parable exactly as she told it. In a dream given me September 29, 1886, I was walking with a large company who were looking for berries. There were many young men and women in the company who were to help in gathering the fruit. We seemed to be in a city for there was very little vacant ground, but around the city there were open fields, beautiful groves, and cultivated gardens. A large wagon laden with provisions for our company went before us. Soon the wagon halted and the party scattered in every direction to look for fruit. All around the wagon were both high and low bushes bearing large, beautiful whortleberries, but the company were all looking too far away to see them. I began to gather the fruit nearby, but very carefully for fear of picking the green berries, which were so mingled with the ripe fruit that I could pick only one or two berries from a cluster. Some of the nice large berries had fallen to the ground and were half consumed by worms and insects. Oh, thought I, if this field had only been entered before, all this precious fruit might have been saved, but it is too late now. I will, however, pick these from the ground and see if there is any good in them. Even if the whole berry is spoiled, I can at least show the brethren what they might have found if they had not been too late. Just then, two or three of the party came sauntering around to where I was. They were chatting and seemed to be much occupied with each other's company. Seeing me, they said, we have looked everywhere and can find no fruit. They looked with astonishment at the quantity I had. I said, there are more to be gathered from these bushes. They began picking, but soon stopped saying, it's not fair for us to pick here. You found this spot and the fruit is yours. But I replied, that makes no difference. Gather wherever you can find anything. This is God's field and these are his berries. It's your privilege to pick them. But soon I seemed to be alone again. Every little while I heard talking and laughing at the wagon. I called out to those who were there, what are you doing? They answered, we could not find any berries, and as we were tired and hungry, we thought we would come to the wagon and take a lunch. After we have rested a while, we will go out again. But, I said, you have brought in nothing as yet. You're eating up all our supplies without giving us any more. 
I cannot eat now. There is too much fruit to be picked. You did not find it because you did not look close enough. It does not hang on the outside of the bushes. You must search for it. True, you cannot pick it by handfuls, but by looking carefully among the green berries, you will find very choice fruit. My small pail was soon full of berries, and I took them to the wagon. Said I, this is the nicest fruit that I have ever picked, and I gathered it nearby, while you have wearied yourselves by searching at a distance without success. Then all came to see my fruit. They said, these are high bush berries, firm and good. We did not think we could find anything on the high bushes, so we hunted for low bush berries only, but found few of these. Then I said, will you take care of these berries and then go with me to look for more fruit on the high bushes? But they had made no preparation to care for the fruit. There were dishes and sacks in abundance, but they had been used to hold food. I became tired of waiting and finally asked, did you not come to gather fruit? Then why are you not prepared to take care of it? One responded, Sister White, we did not really expect to find any fruit where there were so many houses and so much going on. But as you seem to be so anxious to gather fruit, we decided to come with you. We thought we would bring enough to eat and would enjoy the recreation if we did not gather any fruit. I answered, I cannot understand this kind of work. I shall go to the bushes again at once. The day is already far spent. Soon the night will be here in which we can gather no fruit. Some went with me, but others remained by the wagon to eat. In one place, a little company had collected, and they were busily talking about something in which they seemed much interested. I drew near and found that a little child in a woman's arms had attracted their attention. I said, you have but a little time and might better work while you can. The attention of many was attracted by a young man and a young woman who were running a race to the wagon. On reaching it, they were so tired that they had to sit down and rest. Others had also thrown themselves down on the grass to rest. Thus the day wore on and very little was accomplished. At last I said, brethren, you call this an unsuccessful expedition. If this is the way you work, I do not wonder at your lack of success. Your success or failure depends upon the way you take hold of the work. There are berries here, for I have found them. Some of you have been searching the low bushes in vain. Others have found a few berries, but the high bushes have been passed by simply because you did not expect to find fruit on them. You see that the fruit which I have gathered is large and ripe. In a little while, other berries will ripen and we can go over the bushes again. This is the way in which I was taught to gather fruit. If you had searched near the wagon, you might have found fruit as well as I. Ellen White was not done admonishing the people in her dream. The lesson that you have this day, given to those who are just learning how to do this kind of work, will be copied by them. The Lord has placed these fruit-bearing bushes right in the midst of these thickly settled places, and he expects you to find them but you have been altogether too much engaged in eating and amusing yourselves. You did not come to the field with an earnest determination to find fruit. You must hereafter work with more zeal and earnestness and with an altogether different object in view, or your labors will never be successful. By working in the right way, you will teach the younger workers that such matters as eating and recreation are of minor importance. It has been hard work to bring the wagon of supplies to the ground, but you have thought more of the supplies than of the fruit you ought to carry home as the result of your labors. You should be diligent, first to pick the berries nearest you, and then to search for those farther away. After that, you can return and work nearby again, and thus you will be successful. Wow. What a dream. Unlike my dreams, this one has lots of detail in it and it made sense. And I'm sure that's why Ellen White wrote it down. 
It was interesting, but her dream also carried a message in every part. As I read the parable of the dream several times, lessons were jumping out at me all the way through. When we say, I will go, there is an expectation that not only will we sow seed and plant saplings, but we will also gather fruit. When we say, I will go in response to the call of God, inherent in that promise is a commitment to bring something back to him. We do not throw seeds out into the field without an intention that there will be a harvest. And this dream has a lot to teach us about bringing in the harvest. It teaches us about the quality of work we are to do when we gather the fruit. So let's take a closer look. And let me warn you right here that I will break the rule of all sermons, which says that you should only tell people three points. I cannot keep this to three points. No way. Ellen White's parable of the berry pickers has many more lessons than three, and we must catch them all because I have just one shot at this parable with you today. But I will put in front of you the words for you to see, and we'll make time and tell stories, and we will arrive safely at the final review. So here we go. The first thing I noticed in the story of berry picking was that those who had gone out to gather the fruit were not looking at the fruit. They all had their eyes focused on something far out. Something beyond where they were. Ellen White points out that they were surrounded by fruit, ready to be picked, but their eyes were ignoring what was close. How strange. So the first lesson of gathering the fruit is, don't look so far away that you miss seeing the fruit right in front of you. Start nearby. This is one of the problems, I think, with the motto, I will go. It's a good motto, a good theme. But I wonder so often, what am I doing to reach out to our neighbors here where I live at Ayas? I can go preach in Sarawak. I can share my faith in Cambodia. And I could go with Pastor Sam Saw to bring encouragement to the believers of Myanmar. All of that is good. But what about the people right here where I live in Silang? I keep wondering about that and praying about that. There is fruit that is ripening near me. Am I looking past it? Don't look so far away that you miss seeing the fruit right in front of you. The next lesson is the one of readiness. Ellen White said, the green berries were so mingled with the ripe fruit that I could pick only one or two berries from a cluster. I used to notice that when I was picking berries. A fully ripe one would be right next to a sour one, which needed more time in the sunshine to ripen. Usually I could tell the difference, but sometimes I couldn't. A lesson for gathering fruit is that we must be careful to choose and pick that which is ripe. But we must also be careful to care for that which is not ripe. If I am so careless that I bruise or injure or pluck a berry that is not ready, it won't be ready for me to harvest later either. Have you encountered people who are sour at the message you bring to them? Be careful, be kind. You do not know the circumstances of their lives. Wait for a while. The Holy Spirit is like the sunshine and like the latter rain. And in the fullness of time, things may change and the sour person may be ready for a later harvest. As Ellen White in her dream worked around the green berries to pick the blue berries, she understood this principle. It was sad for me to read of the large berries that had fallen and were half eaten by worms and bugs. If only someone had come to harvest those earlier. How often do we miss an opportunity to bring someone to Jesus when their hearts are ready? How often do the circumstances of their lives then change? And there are things introduced into their lives that rot their lives and eat away at them. When they could have been gathered into the kingdom, had someone been paying attention to the timing of their readiness. The lesson here is to not hesitate. When the harvest is ready, bring it in before the berries have been rotted by pests. I don't know what the custom is here, but when I was growing up, 
I remember wanting to be baptized already at the age of eight. In those days, in the Penang church where I grew up, it tended to be frowned upon to baptize children. We were supposed to wait until we could think for ourselves, and it was not clear when that would happen. I finally was baptized in the Penang church on my 14th birthday. It was a happy day, a significant day. But as I have reflected on it later, there was nothing different in my commitment to Jesus at the age of 14 than there was at the age of eight. I knew in my mind and heart when I was eight years old, and I wanted to make that statement to others. In some ways, waiting took a risk that negative influences might have worked on me, or I might have become so sure of my own thinking that I was becoming cynical and questioning. We know from the story of Philip and the Ethiopian eunuch that the eunuch said to Philip, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? And Philip agreed. It was time to gather in the fruit right then and there. And Philip did. Had he waited, would there have been another chance? The second part about the fruit that has already gotten over ripe and fallen is to notice whether there are any good ones there. Are there parts of berries that are good, worth picking up? God does not call to himself only the perfect. People often have soft spots, and yet he chooses them anyhow and uses them to his name's glory, restoring and enlivening them. We can help with the harvest of people like this. I have seen young people who have some worrisome characteristics brought to Jesus and their lives change. They deepen, they develop Christ-like characters. Who are we to say that they are rotten and cannot be harvested? If that boy or girl were your child or my child, wouldn't you want someone to notice that the whole berry is not spoiled and bring it in with the harvest? The lesson then is to look for those berries that can be salvaged, add them to the harvest. The next lessons are given to us by those people in the dream who seemed to be distracted. In this part, these berry pickers were distracted from their chat by social interaction. Their priorities were on one another, on the social life. Ellen White remarked, they were chatting and seemed to be much occupied with each other's company. They were so distracted that they were surprised by how much she had gathered. They hadn't noticed all the berries. So the lesson of distractions says, avoid those distractions which come up in the social life with your fellow laborers. Friendships are good, but they are good when they do not deter you from the mission. They are good when you are focused together on mission. I found this one very interesting. The people with the social focus protested that they couldn't pick right there because this was Ellen White's territory. It is not fair for us to pick here. You found this spot and the fruit is yours. How often do we go out to gather fruit and we want the credit to be ours? This is my territory, my fruit, my number of baptisms. There is a little bit of kingly power seeking to raise its head in all of us, a little bit of glory that we are so often tempted to seek. Ellen White's response in her dream was the perfect answer to turf wars, as we call those disagreements about who gets the power and who gets the credit. That makes no difference, she told the young people. Gather wherever you can find anything. This is God's field, and these are his berries. It is your privilege to pick them. When we're gathering fruit, it is not about us. It is about bringing in fruit for God. Whoever does it, it is about not missing any that is ripe and not bruising any that is not ripe. It is about the task, not the glory of the picker. And dare I say this, it is not about personal soul winning targets. There's something very wrong about quotas to meet. Ellen White makes this clear. This is God's field and these are his fruit. We all go and do the work and it is for him, whatever we bring in when we are giving it our best effort. 
Poor Ellen. In her dream, she was not working with very high quality harvesters. She notes that she was alone because the people who were supposed to be gathering berries were tired and hungry and distracted by the food and the relaxation. Sometimes in the church, we plan to make the workers comfortable and that comfort can be detracting and distracting. I'll be honest, when I was a missionary kid, I noticed that a lot of the church officials liked to travel. When they traveled, they got per diem. They got nice hotels to stay in. They were treated to meals at the places where they visited. This is not to say that we should make church officials sleep on the sidewalk and beg for their food. But I do remember the admiration I heard in the voices of some of my friends when a new mission president came in. And as he traveled, he asked if he could sleep on the floor at the local pastor's house. And he took local ground transportation where he could with the common people. The point is not the comforts. The point is when those comforts become distractions and when we pull away from the work to enjoy those comforts when the work should be going on, that's the point to pay attention to. The berry pickers Ellen White observed claimed that the work was not fruitful, so they came in to treat themselves at the food wagon and to take a nice nap. This was the distraction from picking berries. I can just hear Ellen White's frustration in her dream. These were like the five foolish virgins who used up all their oil as they waited. You're eating up what the workers should have and you're not contributing to the work. Get back out there and gather the berries, you lazy people. Okay, she didn't call them lazy, but you can see it in there as she tells them what to do. This is the lesson. We must build our skill and capacity to work with endurance. Where can the fruit be found? How can we get it? How do we prepare best for bringing in the harvest? The institution where I work, IAS, focuses on just this point. It is our goal to build people who excel in the skill and capacity to work with endurance for the gospel of Jesus Christ. The students should be learning the theories and the practices in their areas that strengthen them for the long haul to lead and organize others and to finish the work, as we used to say when I was a child. It is not a short-term, three-month training that can do this at the level that leaders need to function. Skill and endurance are built up by developing it over time. You can't kick back and enjoy your celebration over a few berries picked and take a nap. You must become much more strategic and sturdy than that. Well, we're not done. Ellen White's pail was full and she went to pour it into the big bucket and head back out to pick more. Notice what she says in her dream. I gathered it nearby. You wore yourselves out by searching at a great distance. I think it's important to get close to your harvest. This is not the same as me reaching out to my neighbors in Silang. This is the concept of I will go that takes us to where the fruit is, where we stay and get to know it, and know when it is ready. When we share the gospel with others, we need to get close to know those whom we invite to come to Jesus. When we go to lead in a church organization, we need to get close to know those whom we serve. You have wearied yourselves by searching at a distance, Ellen White said. What do these people care about? Who are their families? What are their needs? How ready are they? Where do they live? These are things that those who gather the fruit know by going to live among them for a while. This is why I'm attracted to what frontline missionaries do. My understanding is that they go and settle in for a while. They get close to their harvest and they know when it's ready. I once asked my Malaysian brother, who has watched many missionaries over the years, how long do you think it takes for a missionary to become fully effective in a new place? About four years, he said, four years. If I reach full effectiveness in another two years, having been here nearly two years, my very best work will be in the next six years after that, 
until I retire. If you go in to do an evangelistic series, baptize people, and then you leave, is that getting close to your harvest? Who should be gathering the fruit? And what should their investment in being close to that fruit be? Speaking of the fruit, I notice in this parable that the fruit pickers were focusing only on the low bush berries. While they were busy picking the easy to reach ones below their line of sight, they were missing the higher up ones, which were just as ripe. Does God tell us to bring in just the ones who are easy to find? Just the ones who believe easily? Just the ones who are like us or like the others that we have brought in? God wants us to gather in the fruit, all the fruit that is ready, wealthy and poor, schooled and unschooled, old and young, sickly and well, quirky and normal. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, the Apostle Paul said to the centurion, and you will be saved. That's the fruit we bring in, all who are willing to believe in Jesus and want to be saved. Sometimes we find those in unusual places, but in this parable, that's where we need to look. High bushes and low bushes. Do quality work. Get them all. Now notice this. Ellen White told them to take care of the berries before they went to look for more fruit. And here she said, I can just hear her sigh, they had made no preparation to care for the fruit. I became tired of waiting and finally asked, did you not come to gather the fruit? Then why are you not prepared to take care of it? My friends, if you are not prepared to take care of the fruit you pick, you are not a good berry picker. What is your container for holding the fruit? What are the conditions needed to keep the fruit well? How will you transport it safely from point A to point B? Here again, I see the principles that diverge from the hit and run evangelism that some would prefer to practice. When you bring in the harvest, you must care for it. You must plan for this in advance. Who will nurture the new believers? Should it not be the one who they have already gotten to know who brought them in? Are they supplied with the tools and the resources to care for the fruit they have brought in? One person made an excuse to Mrs. White that they hadn't expected to find fruit in the city. Now, isn't that interesting? Why would fruit not grow in the city? And what are we doing about all the fruit that is in the city where there are so many houses to be gathered in? One thing I have been learning from the missiologists at IS is that there is lots of fruit in cities. We need to carry out the harvest there. It may not be where we expect. It may not look like what we expect, but it is there. Can we prepare people who know what to look for? who know the best ways to harvest in the cities and to care for the fruit that is harvested there? Notice what people said who didn't think there was fruit where there were so many houses. We just came for the good time. We would eat, we would play. We didn't take the idea seriously that we were going to actually gather any fruit. This is for all the leaders and employers listening to my sermon today. Just as the boys who worked in my yard had different levels of engagement with their work, there will always be people in the work who come with low expectations and self-serving motives. We'll eat, we'll play, we'll get our pay at the end, but we're really not here to do the work, the quality work of picking berries. To you who work with people like that, I would say, be kind. While it is true that some people don't buy into the mission very well, or work very hard. It is also true that they are working next to you and when they work next to you, they can catch the flame. When they work next to you, they can see your example. When they work next to you, sometimes God is working on their hearts, maturing them for his purposes. Everyone has the opportunity to change under the work of the Holy Spirit. It's not over until their lives are over. Yes, they're frustrating, and you can try to guide and inspire. Be kind as you do that. And remember, 
that kindness includes making the objectives and the explanations clear to them. We're going to pop back to lesson number five for a moment. In the parable of gathering the berries, there were other distractions. A small child distracted some. A competitive couple got distracted. I love children, but there is a reason we usually don't send out young mothers to the field. And I am quite skeptical about sending young fathers away from their children as well. Children are a gift of God, don't get me wrong. There is a time, however, to nurture them close by because they are your close fruit. And then there's a time when they jump out of the nest and fly and you're free to gather other fruit. Additionally, competition pretty much always is distracting and has a negative effect on people. Implicit or explicit competition for how much fruit we bring in is not good. Any other kind of competition where harvest should be happening is not good. When you have gone to gather fruit, you need the whole team there, all paying attention, all working together without distractions, without competition. Did I mention that this parable is complex? We have a few more quick ones to go. I was intrigued by this one as Ellen White was making her last comments to the berry pickers in her dream. In a little while, other berries will ripen and we can go over the bushes again. How often have you returned for another sweep of harvesting? Some fruit ripens later and you should not miss getting it. Come back, gather some more. Now you know where to look. Additionally, she reminded the berry pickers that earnest determination is necessary if you're going to find all the fruit. Ellen White also used the word zeal. There is a goal out there and your heart is on fire to accomplish it. Zeal. Let me use a theoretical woman as my example. Have you seen a soul winner who approaches her work with all her heart? I have, and it is a beautiful thing to see. This objective fills her whole heart and it drives her daily energies she is irresistible because she knows what she wants to do and she pours her whole self into it. Earnest determination, zeal. I have seen an elementary teacher who does that. Her name is Norma and she lives out in the desert, the desert of California in a very ugly place near a prison. Many of the children in her schoolroom are the children of prisoners whose families have come to live there so that they can visit. Norma wants these children to come to know and love Jesus. And her life speaks of her earnest determination, her zeal. These children come through her school and they learn something quite different than their parents modeled to them. They have a chance because of Norma's example and her words at something other than what put their father or their mother in prison. You must hereafter work with more zeal and earnestness and with an altogether different object in view or your labors will never be successful said mrs white in her dream and here is the very last lesson of the story you have thought more of the supplies than of the fruit you ought to carry home as the result of your labors we are always thinking of strategies and supplies. I will go, total member involvement, reach the world. How do I get to all of the 1040 window? What are my objectives? What KPIs will I need to accomplish? All of these are useful in our thinking, but the last lesson is not of supplies, not of objectives, and not of KPIs. The last lesson is that we must care about the fruit more than anything else. Ellen White's advice to the other berry pickers was to think of nothing more constantly than the fruit. Care about that. Well, we've gone through 14 lessons, 14, way past the three that I'm supposed to have in a sermon. And they all are contained in a story about many berry pickers who didn't really understand berry picking. 
I have learned some lessons in studying this dream, and I trust you have too. Let me summarize briefly the lessons, and then we'll be done. One, start nearby. Two, pick what is ripe and be careful with what is not ripe. Three, don't wait to harvest. Four, look for all that you can salvage. Five, avoid distractions, every type of distraction. Six, build your endurance. Seven, get close to what you're harvesting. Eight, bring in all that are ready. Nine, take care of the fruit after you pick it. 10, harvest in the cities. 11, expect some poor workers. 12, come back for a second harvest. 13, work with earnest determination and zeal. And 14, care about the fruit more than anything else. I trust that you're not overwhelmed. The lessons are many, 14 in all, that I've found in this parable, but they're not hard lessons. In fact, they are common sense. Ellen White's dream of the berry parable was remarkably wise. So now let me close with a need. I don't know who's listening to me. I don't know your place in life. But Jesus has given us a prayer request. And you may be the answer to that prayer request. So here it is. Seeing the crowds, he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and downcast like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Therefore, plead with the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. Will you pray for that? And might he be calling you to go?